Dr. Reed is a research psychologist at UCLA Gambit Studies Program. Um, he practices here in Nevada um, and is one of the runs one of the clinics that provides treatment. Um, he has trained, educated thousands of people, and everybody makes a sacrifice to, to be a part of our conference because we expect everybody to chip in what they can. Rory is making the greatest sacrifice of all today. It's his birthday. Oh. But I really kind of like to have a, an interactive kind of a, an experience. It, it, um, although time is going to be uh, a little bit uh, uh, scarce this morning, we've got a lot of material to go through. <coughs> I've tried to uh, create this presentation. It's, it's really two presentations in one. Uh, one of them emerged out of a, uh, the grant from the state of Nevada, uh, Public and, and Behavioral Health Services. They gave us a grant to a small little study on suicidality uh, with one of the graduate students at UNLV. I, I uh, sponsored, mentored her, and uh, talk a little about that for just a little bit, and then jump into stress. Uh, the good news is, if we don't get through all of the material, uh, it, my email is right here, and so if you want to. My assistant's going to hate me for this, but if you want to send me an email, uh, I'm happy to give you one of two things. First of all, you'll notice in the binder, there is a, a handbook that I created, again, through uh, funding from the, uh, the Nevada State uh, uh, Health Department uh, and Behavioral Public Health. Uh, they give us a grant to put together this uh, handbook on stress. And it's really for problem gamblers, and it was created out of the, all of the stress that was created through the pandemic uh, at, the, at the very outset. Uh, but what you'll notice in that particular uh, manual or little hand, uh, handbook is that there's a lot of hyperlinks that you obviously can't, you know, hit on by pushing on the paper. So uh, I believe we're going to post it on the uh, Nevada Council's website, so you'll have it there. Uh, but also, feel free to email me. I've told my assistant that to expect a lot of emails here in the next couple of days. And we'll, we'll send you an electronic PDF file of that that you can then, you know, send to your students. Or sorry, your, uh, your uh, I'm in that mode too. Uh, so that you can send to your patients and so forth if you want to use it for that. You'll also find that there's references to problem gambling, but this obviously can be generalized to addiction populations more broadly. Uh, and there's some exercises, links to TED Talks, links to YouTube videos, all of the rest of that. Are you wanting me to stay stationary here? Nope. The podium? Okay, so, all right, just want to make sure. Uh, so there's, there's that resource. Also, if you go to the UCLA Gambling Studies website, uh, uh, and uh, just Google UCLA Gambling Studies, and then on the very left-hand column you'll see YouTube channel. You can go to the YouTube channel, and if I run out of time today with this presentation on the, the stress part of it, there's an entire uh, presentation that I gave to all of the California providers that's recorded with all of the slides and interactive and all of that. So if, if, if I tried to give the presentation in a way where it was kind of a hybrid, it could be applicable for um, healthcare providers and therapists, but also, if a problem gambler watched the video, they would get a lot out of it for their own personal recovery. So it's something you could watch yourself or you could share with uh, your patients and have it be uh, hopefully beneficial and advantageous uh, as well. There's some other videos on our website, one we did on mindfulness and some other things there that might be helpful for you. The second thing is the suicide uh, study that we did, it's uh, under review right now with one of the peer-reviewed journals. But I'm happy to give you, you know, a, a full copy of the study if you want to read that. It was done on the clinic. Uh, you know, I usually fly back and forth every week between LA and here, and I see patients at the clinic here. And we gathered data and all of our data from a couple of years, and we did the study on that, looking at, you know, suicidality in a population of Las Vegas gamblers. Because part of the premise here is. The, the rate, as you know, is like twice the national average of 6%, right? And so uh, if, the, if we have a high rate of problem gamblers, it stands to reason, at least, that we might have a higher prevalence rate of, of possible suicidality uh, or suicide risk in, in Las Vegas gamblers compared to elsewhere. And the study looked at that. 
So, um, so that's kind of covered my basis. I'm going to kind of feel free to just kind of uh, go through some of this stuff. Some of it maybe skip a little bit if I think it's, it's not where the best use of our time is. And uh, realizing that you're going to get all the content uh, independent of this presentation. So if I talk really quickly, which I often do, not because I'm manic, it's just my presentation style, you'll have an opportunity to kind of go back if you kind of like to learn a little bit slower and, and um, uh, read and review and underline things, then you can do that. So this is kind of an interesting quote uh, by Dr. Rudd. And it really is true that the more we learn, the less we know and the more questions that we have. That's essentially what uh, he's saying. And, and I'm not going to read the quotes verbatim, uh, because if I do that, why am I here, right? You can just read my slides and get that out of it. I'll feel free to kind of just venture around here as we talk. But this is an interesting comment that he makes, and it is true. Um, we, as, as, as much as we've evolved as a science, the area of suicide in general, more broadly, is an area where at best, our prediction rate is 50% at best. We, it's really, we're great at predicting correlates of suicide, but we've really failed as a science to actually predict suicide itself. So we can say, yeah, if you're more hopeless, if you're more depressed, if you're more lonely, if, you've, you know, if you're more impulsive, you know, all of these correlates, then you're at higher risk for suicide. The problem is, all of the correlates of suicidality create a tremendous number of false positives. So even though depression is correlated with suicide, the vast majority of people who are depressed will not kill themselves. Right? And, and so it is with a lot of the factors. Comorbid psychopathology, comorbid substance use disorders, uh, comorbid uh, prevalence of personality traits such as shame or impulsivity genetic factors, right? Uh, all of these things that correlate with suicidality in and of themselves are poor predictors of actual suicide. And that's what makes assessing suicide so difficult and so tricky. Um, so if we take a look overall at some of the various things, you know, the thing that's kind of interesting in the, in the field of problem gambling is this range and, and I've got it here. Two people over in this corner of the room feel neglected. I want to come hang out. No offense to these guys. I'm going to hang out with you guys for just a minute. But you notice that this range, this huge range of suicidality um, statistics in problem gambling were like, what? You mean it can be all the way from 12% up to 92%? How is that, like, is that sloppy research? Like, why can't we get a more accurate number? So think about research. <laughs> and, and the different ways that we'll approach this issue in scientific studies. So we've got the question of the population, right? Is this an inpatient population, an outpatient population? Is it a population that has co-occurring psychopathology, or is it kind of this sanitized sample of problem gamblers that don't have comorbid psychopathology, they don't have co-occurring substance use disorders? Think about populations in terms of uh, veterans, right? Uh, elderly people, younger people, the different types of uh, things there. We also have the different measures that are being used and the instruments that are being used to measure suicide in these studies. You also have studies that are taking a look at, I mean, we all know kind of on the suicide literature, you've got parasuicidal attempts, uh, suicidal ideation based on thoughts, and then you've got even the things about, is this passive thoughts or, uh, uh, or is it actual intent? And by the way, the whole issue when you're assessing suicide, and the VA's done a really brilliant job with this particular question and some of their measures, and it's looking at intent. And in the legal realm, attorneys crucify us in court over intent. Because the legal field has a completely different definition of intent than the mental health field. And we come at it with mental health perspective and lens, and the attorneys come at it with the legal definition of intent. And so I'm not going to get into the nuances of that today, but if you want to really kind of 
take a look at that and you're concerned about you know, liability and all that, it's really important to understand the whole issue of intent as it pertains to suicide. But that's one of the reasons why we have this really broad range of, of statistics because of all the different ways that studies come at this question. All right. We also have uh, this idea that, like you know, with gambling and, and all of the rest of that, you've got suicide attempts uh, being uh, pretty prevalent. Um, and interestingly, problem gamblers attempting suicide at some point in their lifetime is pretty high compared to other populations that we see. And so, the point with all of these statistics is what. Well, when we're assessing our patients for problem gambling, we should be screening for suicidality. And, you know, if you want to take a look at different screeners, there's different measures out there. I'll give you some examples of those uh, in just a minute. Uh, but at the end of the day, and when I teach graduate students and we're training the, the, them to be mental health professionals, I, I always have them read this article. And by the way, if, if this is an article that you want, again, if you email us, just let me know, hey, I want this file article. Even though it's an older article, it goes through. And at the end of this article, it kind of leaves you feeling a little bit depressed about your ability to assess suicide because it talks about all those false positives. And at best, it seems like at the end of this article, it's almost a guessing game. And, and, and it's not quite, there is a little bit of precision in this in terms of the questions that we ask. But that being said, it is important to realize that there's a lot of false positive. And again, we're good at um, assessing these correlates, but the actual things that will predict suicide are less um, uh, accurate than the, the predictions. So here's all of the risk factors that are associated with suicide and problem gamblers and things that we need to be curious about. And of course, not only with problem gamblers, but populations more generally, a previous suicide attempt is the most significant predictor of a future suicide completion. And we have to be curious about those attempts for the attention-seeking behaviors. Um, and even like even in attention-seeking behaviors, parasuicidal attempt kinds of things, we have to be curious about the population and all the other correlates. So for example, uh, even though suicide ideation and, and attempts and all of that are frequent in populations with borderline personality disorder, suicide completion is less, uh, less common. But the caveat is what? If a person with a borderline personality disorder makes a suicide attempt and we don't take it seriously, even though it's an attention-seeking behavior, they turn up the volume and it's almost like, oh, you're not taking me seriously? Okay, well maybe I'll do something a little bit more. And, and then they escalate it to the point where it's like, okay. Uh, so we do need to be, uh, you know, those, all of those nuances. And I'm not gonna get into all of those nuances here in, in the few, few minutes that we have. Uh, but I am gonna give you some references for a couple of trainings that I think do a really good job at going into some of these nuances uh, so that you can pursue this outside of our, our time today. So, um, historically, this is kind of the model that we've worked from with gambling and suicide, right? The idea that you've got mental health uh, issues uh, co-occurring with gambling severity and that that intermixes also with uh, comorbid in cases where there is comorbid substance abuse and then that increases suicide attempts which obviously increases the risk of suicide completion. This is, the, and this is the model we worked off for years. And uh, Dr. David Hodgins up at the University of Calgary, uh, our studies and our research out of UCLA and a few others have since modified this model to add one component. And, and if, you, you know, if you've got like a bullet point of, hey, here's five things I want to take from this talk, uh, and you're doing that throughout the day, this is a slide that you want to take from this talk because this is the salient point. Gambling consequences. This is what we now add to this model of predicting suicide attempts and subsequent suicide completion. Is Although gambling severity can include consequences, 
You can have somebody, for example, not all symptoms are equal, right? If we're diagnosing a gambling disorder, not all symptoms are equal. We get that, right? That's one of the limitations of the DSM. And it's actually a criticism of the mild, moderate, and severe classifiers. Because mild, moderate, and severe is, like, is based on symptom count, but that assumes all symptoms are equal, which is nonsense. We all know that that's not true. But that's the way the, C the DSM treats it in terms of gambling severity and those classifiers. Uh, and, and we could give examples of how that is, but I'm going to pr pr assume that there's enough clinical acumen in this room that I don't need to go into that detail. But, but the types of consequences that, uh, 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 that uh, are potentially uh, contributing to, to the gambling uh, or sort of to suicide are the things that we should be curious about. And they tend to uh, vary around, and again, it's a little bit of, little bit of gender differences, but it tends to be uh, around financial losses, and then other losses such as familial relationship losses, and job losses, right? Like those are some of the most severe consequences. Uh, so if someone's going through a divorce related to the gambling disorder and all the rest of that, and even getting to the nuances of that, right? When you have an attorney, and I always have my patients bring in the, their divorce paperwork and, the, and the, the pending litigation, because there's information in those documents. That, like, for example, oh, wow, your uh, exes or your soon-to-be exes opposing counsel, they figured out the, the marital waste law, and they're using it here in your divorce case, which means you're going to get stuck in a lot worse way because they're going to claim that your gambling addiction uh, exhibited marital waste, and, and it's true, right? It's true. And I'm not the expert. We've got Judge Moss and other people here in the room that are experts on the law. But, but clinically, in terms of in outcomes, I've seen this happen time and time again in Nevada, that family law attorneys will look at that marital waste law in the wake of a gambling problem, and it will be used as leverage to reduce the amount of uh, money that someone's given, or it will increase the amount of alimony payments. They manipulate that in different ways. But again, and so all of a sudden now, this person's going through this loss, and then there's losses within that loss that then create that hopelessness, despair, and all of the rest of that. So the gambling consequences, we ought to be very curious about those kinds of questions when we're assessing for suicide. And this is one of the ways we can indirectly, because gambling consequences is the best proxy that we have for suicide attempts, uh, in addition to all the other correlates. Does that make sense? Okay. Any questions, comments? Yeah. Uh, on the previous screen, um, there was drug use, but not alcohol use. That yeah. surprised me. Yeah, so if you look across the studies uh, on this, um, and this is a consistent finding, is that uh, uh, drugs, uh, but not alcohol abuse uh, tend to be uh, more predictive and, and we're not quite sure why, I mean speculation to assume why that's the case. Uh, there's a few ideas out there, I'm happy to talk about that a little bit later. So, um, consequences. Alright, so if we take a look at the assessments, um, again I'm not going to get into the nuances of this. Some of this stuff may be from graduate school, you've learned it, if not, here's just kind of the and they'll make my PowerPoint. I just gave it to them uh, uh, this morning at 8 o'clock because I finished it at 7.30. And uh, so they'll, they'll put it on the website. Because uh, I was stressed out this week. Uh, lots of stuff going on. Anyway, but there's different, um, you know, there's different uh, instruments here. There's the one from SAMHSA's website. You can go to that. Again, the one from the uh, self-directed uh, violence classification system. Uh, there's a few people from the VA over at my table. Are you guys still using that? Yeah. They've really come along. You guys have come a long way with this, and I really like it. I think it's one of the better uh, things. It's kind of a decision tree that kind of walks you through. And as I talked about earlier, uh, they really kind of help clarify what we mean by intent in this model, right? So the VA's done an immaculate job. If you really want to kind of start to understand the nuances of suicide assessment, I think that's a good place. And then we use in at the hospital at UCLA and elsewhere, the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale. There's some training, online free training. You get a little certificate on that and all the rest of that. Um, so those are some, the, the three things that, uh, those are the three instruments that, that I pretend to, when I teach the graduate students in graduate school, those are the ones we focus on. I'm not trying to marginalize or uh, other instruments out there, but these are the ones that I think um, get at stuff in, in a decent way. And then uh, the study that we did, 
uh, and again, this is under review right now. It was funded by the department. I just want to recognize uh, Kim Garcia and, and her groups out of the department who have helped fund this, and, and Andrea and her group at UNLV that reviewed all the grant uh, the proposals. And so, essentially, again, I'm happy to give the full study to anybody that wants it. But essentially, some of this stuff is is replicated from other you know, studies in suicide, it's nothing novel, uh, but again, wanted to just present it here. We had a sample of 117 patients, and these were consecutive admissions. Our response rate was 95%. We tend to have pretty high response rates because I talk about research at the very get-go, and talk about like how even research affects how we treat, and, and we turn to the research to give us uh, uh, empirically formed uh, interventions and all the rest of that. So my, and even in therapy, when I'm doing patients, I'll, I'll talk about research studies that answer, when they ask me questions, I will often say, well, let me tell you what the research says about the question that you just asked. So they, they're pretty supportive of that. And um, so, uh, not surprising, suicide risk positively correlated with all these other things. Again, with an emphasis on gambling consequences. That's what we really want to focus on and pay attention to. Um, not to, surprising, it's, it's inversely correlated with life satisfaction and perceived emotional support. Although, interestingly, perceived emotional support has never been measured in any study on problem gambling and suicide. That's why we included that in our study. So, remember from your graduate studies and your clinical training, the actual support that someone has is not as relevant as what they perceive their support to be. So, it's a subjective variable in when assessing patients. They might have all the support in the world at their doorstep, but if they don't recognize that and perceive it as such, then they're going to feel hopeless, you know, despair and all the rest of that. Um, so, uh, you know, we found in our study it was significantly correlated with drug uh, abuse, as, as again has been noted, but the associations with alcohol abuse were unremarkable. Um, classification amongst the Las Vegas sample was 41% of the sample. Thoughts of suicide was common, and 38.5% uh, of the sample. Notice this was what I thought was interesting in our measure of suicidality. Uh, it asks, like, did you know how likely was it that they thought they would actually commit suicide one day? And this is the first time this has ever been reported. And so this is kind of a novel finding. 8.5% said, you know what, I'm feeling suicidal right now, and if I'm being honest, one day I will, I will, I will complete the act. Right? So what's the implications of this? Well, the implications of that particular statistic is that we assess suicide at the onset and continually throughout treatment. I do it through uh, the UCLA uh, SDA measure, it measures stress depression and anxiety, and I have my patients fill this out every session. It's got a couple, it's got a suicide question on it, and if they screen positive for that suicide question, then we'll talk about what's going on that week. So we need to continually monitor that throughout treatment. It's also very disturbing, okay, if you're familiar with the research on suicide more generally, 76% of people who actually committed suicide, and this was a study that was done a few years ago, did, re, did deny any suicidal ideation in their last contact with their healthcare provider. So we asked the questions, they say no, and then they kill themselves, right? So this kind of, and that was kind of a disturbing thing, because we went back and looked at the records on this, and we're like, wow, and they were asked, they denied it, and then during the week they killed themselves, right? So I think it really begs the question about, hey, that therapeutic alliance and, you know, uh, not being afraid to ask an uncomfortable question. Like, you said that you weren't really thinking about hurting yourself. Uh, you know, is that really how you feel? You've got a lot of stuff going on. I noticed, you know, some of the consequences of the gambling problem are starting to accrue, and that's got to feel really heavy for you. In fact, one of the things I'll do with my patients is I'll say, listen, your bills and all of that, 
you know, we'll take the first five minutes of a therapy session and I'll just say, why don't you come to therapy and open those in the therapy session so that you're not alone. I mean, I'm not going to write a check, I'm not going to pay the bill, but you, you don't have to be alone in that moment when you open it up and you feel the weight of, of the consequences of the bills amount. And we, I do that with patients, I'm not afraid to do that. Um, and then, you know, we'll do some financial literacy and financial planning, a little bit of, of that as well. But that's a moment where they open all those bills. I don't want them to be alone when they do that, right? So just little things like that that we can make adjustments clinically that can sometimes help and make all the difference. Because the biggest thing about people's pain and suffering, and they've done this in a number of studies too, is not the pain and suffering in and of itself. It's experiencing the pain and suffering by themselves alone, right? And we've done this with some pretty crazy studies, right? Like, you know, the study we did where we had people in the MRI and we had them with or without their romantic partner and we'd, we'd, we'd create a little electrical stimulus and, and hurt them. Not, I mean, it was approved by the IRB, don't get me wrong. But it was enough that it was like, ouch, but it wasn't like, oh my God, I'm going to be dying of ECT, right? Um, and, and, and then we would measure, you know, cortical activity in various regions of the brain that are associated with emotional arousal and, and, and pain stimuli. And then we'd have a, a second group that we had their romantic partner, spouse, sit beside them in the MRI and hold their hand. Right? So they weren't alone, and we had saw significantly less cortical arousal in those areas of the brain associated with not just emotional arousal, but also in particular regions. Uh, more of the striatum, the amygdala, and so forth, that are associated with pain, um, affiliation with pain, and those were s showed substantially less cortical uh, activation uh, through fMRI. So really, even their perception and response to the pain was mo so much more less when they had a romantic partner or a loved one that was there just holding their hand. It was kind of that, you're not alone, I'm here, right? Uh, that wasn't in my presentation, so I, that, it's okay, right? I can, you, I, I'm giving you the material. I can take some tangents here. So, um, so that's the, kind of the principle that informs clinical work, right? Like, okay, everybody says, well, you do these neuroimaging studies. How does this translate to anything clinically? Well, there's a good example, right? Like, recognize the most difficult thing about people's pain and suffering is having to go through it alone. And so if we can just be there with them and say, you're not alone, I'm here, and, you know, and just having that empathic, you know, voice and, and saying, you know, yeah, this really sucks, but we're going to get through this together. It can be, can make all the difference. Um, okay, so uh, suicidal gamblers, not surprisingly, reported higher percentages of debt. And again, debt is a proxy for gambling consequences, right? Um, I, I'm trying to avoid this, but I mean, I'm a researcher as well, so I had to put at least one or two charts in here. Um, but let's just move on. I, I mean, you guys don't. Want to say. It, it is what it is, right? It's just kind of supporting the data that, that what I've just been telling you. So um, we didn't also we looked at. There's only been one other study done by uh, Nancy Petri, bless her heart, she's uh, passed uh, unexpectedly a few years ago. While we were all at a gambling conference, we got the news that. Uh, uh, and, and so that was kind of a really uh, uh, sad thing. While we were at the gambling conference, we all heard that she passed away. And, um, but she did a study looking at games of skill versus games of chance. And there was some hypotheses about why people who um, had games of chance might be more at risk for suicide uh, compared to people that did uh, games of skill. And we didn't find any relationship there at all. So we kind of debunked that, at least in our sample, that wasn't true. Um, so again, the idea here, we need to screen and continually assess throughout treatment, and we should be paying attention to uh, gamblers with comorbid psychopathology that's correlated with suicide risk per the more broad literature, and again, helping uh, gamblers connect with emotional support networks such as family, friends, even like Gamblers Anonymous and, and self-help groups can reduce the risk of suicide in this population. And, and, you know, the interesting thing about that whole community, uh, and we had a couple people in Los Angeles they were part of the GA community, and they were really frustrated, like, okay, we've got this pandemic, all of the rooms are shutting down, and GA didn't step up for them, at least this was their report, I'm not saying this was true, but they were saying, GA didn't step up for us, we've got nowhere to go, and they created uh, their own community, it's called gamblersinrecovery.com, and they have over 400 Zoom meetings a week, and 
part of the reason for that is because our, our, some of our gamblers in Los Angeles, that were part of the Jade community, reached out to people across the pond in Europe and England and Ireland, and they actually asked me to do a presentation for one of their Zoom meetings, and Dr. Fong did one and so forth. And literally, they had people from like Australia and New Zealand and Canada and England and Germany and Norway, like it was like this international group on Zoom from all over the world. And they had 400 Zoom meetings a week. And this was kind of their way to say, listen, you know, uh, GA uh, hasn't uh, moved quick enough for us. Uh, we still want to meet as a community. And they developed this online community. And they kind of go off the principles of GA because they couldn't do it under GA's blessing because that just didn't happen in the timely fashion they wanted. And, um, and so again, being aware of these kinds of resources to refer our patients to, especially some that maybe are still a bit anxious about coming out and, and meeting and so forth. But again, even then, the idea of you're not alone, you're part of a, a larger community, connect and get that support. So as far as um, uh, uh, training, uh, C, uh, CE, uh, I, I actually did a, a training just so I could say, yeah, I, I would endorse this versus, and it cost me a whole lot than $35. Um, and to say, like, I did a couple actually, and this is the one that I'm like, okay, I would actually endorse this one. From uh, care, uh, the CE for Less, if you go to their website, this training, one of the things I love about it is they give you a 200 page PDF that's like a manual on suicide. And it's got really great stuff. It's up to date with the most empirically supported kinds of approaches, evidence-based interventions, and uh, the philosophies and, and all of that, and clinical, like pragmatic implications that you could use. Really impressed with this particular training and highly would recommend it. Of the several that I did, this one is, is one. And then here in Nevada, I saw Janine. Janine, where are you? Raise your hand. She's right over there. Her and her posse uh, are part of the CASAC group that does training here in Nevada. And they have, what is it, three different uh, suicide trainings? At least. So, um, uh, so you can go talk to her. They've got a, a couple different websites. I don't know if this is the right one, Janine. Uh, you can get there. All right. So uh, they've got some uh, different suicide trainings as well that you can uh, jump into that will give you credits here. All right, any, that, I'm going to kind of wrap up the suicide stuff for right now. Uh, uh, any questions, uh, comments? Anybody? Have you found that on Zoom you're more at risk for laryngitis? I've had laryngitis four uh -huh. times this past year. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, sorry. The, okay. I can hear you, Denise. Hello. I'm glad you can hear me. Thanks, Ryan. I can hear you. Uh, assist training, A S I S T. Oh, yes. Two Good. days, 16 hours. Awesome. Yep. Uh, by the state person, Misty Allen. I highly recommend that one. Thanks. Thank you. Yes. I, I would say so, too. That's a good one as well. Others? Any other questions, comments? Yeah. I was just curious, what do you think about the CAMS care training? The what? CAMS care? Yeah, no, the CAMS care is another one. Again, I just put a, two, a couple on here. The reason I like the CE one is because they give you the resources associated with this one were phenomenal. The training, the training itself was marginal, but the resource where they gave that information. But the CARES is a good one, the ASSIST is a good one. Yeah. Right. Um, you, you had said that 76% of those who had committed suicide yes, completion. Completion had indicated at their prior session that they had no plans. They didn't know. When we went back and looked at the re records okay. that they had denied suicidality in their last contact with their healthcare provider. Had that been consistent over prior sessions over time? Um, good question. I'd have to go back and look at that study to kind of see if they did it. I think it was just a cross-sectional where they looked at the, the last session. Because what I'm wondering is, only because my mind is on data collection and sure. patterns, is whether or not if the discussion of planning all of a sudden stops, is that a marker of concern? 
In other words, you're, you're thinking about it, you're thinking about it, you're thinking about it. No, actually, everything is fine. Is that in and of itself a marker? Yeah, yeah, fair question. Yeah, fair question. Okay. Any other comments, questions, scathing rebukes? <laughs> All right. Now let's jump into the uh, uh, coping strategies again. You've got this in your uh, manual. So let me tell you, again, just like any professor, we jump into PubMed and the social science literature, and we review the most latest and greatest stuff on, on stress, which is what we did, and certainly spent some time on that. But I thought, you know, a lot of times, the scientific literature doesn't come, like whenever I publish studies, at the end of my study in the discussion section, I always have a so what. Like, okay, what am I going to do differently in my therapy office tomorrow with a patient because of the implications or findings of the study? I wish we did that more, we should do it more, we don't, and it, it is what it is. But I, I thought, you know what, I'm going to go and I'm going to purchase whatever books I can find on Amazon on stress coping in general. So I, I, I ordered probably about 15 books. And uh, as you can appreciate, some of them were written better than others, and, and the material was more accurate in terms of being consistent with the empirical research. So combined with social science research and just pragmatic self-help books and books on stress coping, I merged them. And kind of this, this manual that you, you've got, workbook that I've created for the problem gamblers, is kind of the best of the best of that merger. So that's kind of what, and then obviously my own clinical experience, but collectively that's what informed the content that you have. Oh, you've even got the page that says, so what, right? Like that's what I like to use, like, so what? What am I going to do differently? So, and again, if you go to UCLA Gambling Studies website and to the YouTube channel, you can and go to videos on the YouTube channel, you can find a, an hour-long presentation um, actually, I'm going to 11.45, right? Yeah, so I've got an hour. Maybe I'll actually get through this. Um, so, those are some of the things that I'd like to accomplish today uh, in the hour that we have. Wow, I, I thought I was only presenting for an hour today, but that's great. We're going to get through this after all. But again, if you want to share that link with, a, with some of your patients, and kind of as a homework assignment, uh, I think you're absolutely welcome to do that, and, uh, and, and that will be helpful. And it, goes, it kind of goes through a lot of the stuff that we're talking about here. So first of all, when we take a look uh, at research on stress more broadly, and I want to take a little bit of time to talk about the research, and then let's jump into some pragmatic stuff. You know, stress is kind of conceptualized in a couple of different ways in the social science literature. One is kind of the stimulus-based. Uh, like in terms of characterization of stress. And this really basically says, look, stress, it considers it as a stimulus that causes certain reactions, but this approach is criticized for failing to recognize variance in individual responses. So, in other words, what's stressful for me might not stress you out. Right? And, and I've seen this with when I treat gamblers in California and I've got my, you know, my guy from Beverly Hills like, oh, Dr. Reed, I'm so sorry. You know, I had a slip this weekend. I went to Vegas and I, I lost $3 million and, you know, and, and I'm sitting there and thinking about all the research I could do with $3 million and, and, and trying to, like, be present not have a whole lot of counter-transference going on, you know, <laughs> and then you do what? And, and, you know, but for him, he makes $25 million a month. So $3 million is a drop in the bucket. And then we have patients like at, you know, who are on SSI benefits, Section 8 housing, and, you know, they spend $100 on scratch-offs, uh, in, in California or here, they, they go to the you know the lo local Chevron or 7-Eleven, and they can't even go to the grocery store. But they, they blow 150 bucks on gambling here, and now they're they're figuring out you know where can I get top ramen for the rest of the month for food, and I don't have enough money to go to the coin laundry mat for do my laundry for the month, you know. And so it is this relative thing. So obviously, 
you know, there's an example of, of how $150 of gambling money is going to stress out one person, but it's not going to stress out the other, right? Because they're going to look at that very differently. But that's the idea of this first kind of stress, kind of a response, right? So it's this individual perception and subjective uh, opinion that may determine whether or not something is a stressor or not, right? And if you take a look at Kelly McGonigal's research, and you know they did that follow-up study where they kind of looked at uh, all of these people who reported, you know, how much stress do they have, uh, and and then the second thing was uh, whether or not they, you know, they uh, thought the stress was a good thing or a bad thing, and then they, they the follow-up study was what they looked at public death records to see how many people have died, and what they found was this huge number of people who reported stress died. But it was only true for what? The people that thought stress was bad. The people that had this perspective that stress was good had a very low death rate. So obviously there's this subjective perspective on how we experience things that could be stressors that is gonna determine the health implications and obviously psychological emotional implications for that. But that's kind of, so when we study stress, and even when we're asking our patients about stressors, we need to be curious about the narrative that they attach to something and why they consider that stressful, right? Uh, so, and that can even be true on things that we would, you've just been diagnosed with a chronic illness. Like, how could that not be perceived as a negative event? And yet for some people, you know, and I've been with people in the hospitals that are just like, this is a, a, a it's a very beautiful journey for them. And where they, I've got so much more clarity. I've really, for the first time in my life, figured out what matters most. And, and it's this self-discovery along this journey to the end that's all of a sudden become very finite for them, right? And so it's even in those moments of things that we think would be an absolute stressor, some people can, uh, attach a completely different narrative to that in such a way that it's not a stressful experience. And so for some people, it's been a very peaceful experience. Now, the second way that we look at stress in the social science literature is based on response-based stress. And this is where we hook you up to all that crap that we do in the rat labs and all, you know, galvanic skin response, respiration, uh, cortisol levels, you know, and all the rest of that, right? The problem here in measuring stress is an assumption that we make, and that is that Physiological arousal is correlated with something bad, and that then is a proxy for stress. But if I told you and said, you just won the Powerball, right? That's a positive stressor. And you're going to show all those same signs of physiological arousal that you would from the person that just discovered that you know something tragic or, or you know your loved one's been in a car accident. You're going to see the same physiological arousal. So there's some nuances and difficulties in that particular characterization of, of measuring stress as well. Point being is you know based on the studies and how stress are measured. You know, and I realize a lot of times people just read the abstracts. You know, I'm the one that gets into the nuances, uh, and there are a few others. Uh, that get into the nuances of saying, okay, I want the methodology, and not all studies are the same, and they're not all weighted the same, and all the rest of that. So let's kind of be curious about how they're approaching stress, and then that's going to give us some more information in terms of interpreting the results of the study. So how do we want to define stress for our patients? Typically, this is the definition that I go with. It's an event that occurs when there's this perception that the demands are kind of exceeding the resources, right? Or in other words, this perceived ability to cope with things is deficient. Like I'm not, somehow I'm not going to be able to cope with things. Mm -hmm. Anxiety is just one step removed from that, right? Like anxiety says what? Something bad's going to happen, but the secondary cognition and, and appraisal is, and whatever that bad thing is, I'm not going to be able to handle it. And that's why there's all of the vigilance and anxiety around controlling and reducing the likelihood of an uncertain outcome happening. And what's fascinating about all of this is when we take a look at patients like anxiety, for example, they're so controlling in all these areas of their lives as an effort, and I point out this paradox to my patients, 
Isn't it interesting? In all these other areas of your life, you're so, and I try to use more, um, uh, I don't say you're controlling, I'll say you like things to be very structured and predictable, right? So <laughs> use language that kind of is a little bit more flattery. And, and then I'll say, you know, but isn't it interesting? And, and your goal here is to reduce the likelihood of something bad happening and these uncertain outcomes of things that you imagine can go wrong. And then in the world of gambling, you jump right into uncertainty, right? And yet in these other aspects of your life, when we talk about that paradox, and for some of them, it's like, yeah, wow, you know, like this, having anxiety is so stressful. It's nice to have one domain of my life where I can just let go, and I, I, I'm not in control of the outcome, right? And there's some fascinating psychological implications for that kind of a, 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 a dynamic. So, um, I hope you appreciate this slide. It was difficult for me to get that gift to do this animation. But it's kind of the idea of the, the circularity, if you will. In the DSM, we talk about, uh, essentially what we're saying is, you know, uh, gambling can be in relation to the stress coping kind of a mechanism, right? Or gambling to deal with stress. But the idea also that stress can be a, both a precipitating and a perpetuating risk factor for problem gambling. It's interesting that stress leads to the gambling and then gambling causes distress, right? That's the circularity of it. And the DSM kind of makes that pretty clear. So I kind of point this out to my patients and say, so if we can focus on helping you cultivate some stress coping strategies, we have the ability to help you in the precipitating risk factors and also the perpetuating risk factors of problem gambling. That's pretty cool. That's why we're going to spend some time on this, and that's why this is important. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. That was my birthday present to myself, was to get that slide, get that slide to work. All right. <clears throat> so, a couple different studies on stress. Um, you know, this particular study, and again, I, I'll uh, make sure that the folks, uh, Carol and her staff, get this slide of the show, and you can uh, put it on your, uh, you know, like download it from your website. Um, uh, use it for your personal use. I, I had this happen once. I'm going to just say this. I actually had one of my, I went to a conference once, I sat in the back of the room, the presenter had no idea who I was, and uh, I, I watched them proceed to give a presentation using a slideshow that I had given at a different conference and they put their name on it. I was a little distressed by that. And uh, I, I'm going to just assume that this audience is clinically mature enough to know that that's just like wrong, we don't do that. Um, so uh, the effects of stress on decision making, obviously that stress leads to uh, the poor processing of feedback. So when we're in a stress state, right, when we're in a stress state, we're not our best self. And as a result, we are going to make bad decisions, right? And some of you are like, and we needed a study to tell us that? <laughs> well, okay, we gotta do something with all the NIH dollars, right? But the point here, is that to help patients realize that. Like, so I'll give you an example. Let's say you've got a patient and, and they're stressed about all the consequences of gambling. Um, this is the time, remember, uh, what's the, the, the movie that said, do nothing rash? Like, that's the time you want to tell your patient, do nothing rash. Right now, you are in a stressed state. So some of this is psychoeducation, right? Right now, you are stressed out because of the things that are going on. Don't make any big life decisions right now because you're going to make it from this place of stress and that's not going to be your best decision making. So let's focus on stress reduction, getting you to a healthy place, and then you can make some decisions about your marriage, you can make some decisions about your career, you can make some decisions about your investment portfolio and all these other things. So that's one of the take homes from this study is that like, listen, when I'm stressed, and by the way, if you go and you gamble and you're stressed, Right? Your judgment and your decision making in the gambling activities is going to be uh, deficient. It's not going to be your best decisions in, in that particular regard. So that's one impl implication of some of the studies on stress. Um, this particular study, again, stress led to more gambling urges, which in turn led to gambling severity. Again, not rocket science, but uh, this particular uh, study uh, correlated also stress with gambling severity and psychopathology. 
And uh, this particular study, I think, is probably one of the more interesting ones. And in this particular uh, study, if we look at the HPA axis, and, and I'll show you a slide on that. I don't want to get into the, that particular, uh, the neurobiology of this ad nausea. Uh, there's lots of YouTube videos and things like that, so you can, you can uh, study this out. But you would think that uh, problem gamblers would exhibit uh, under stressful conditions uh, higher cortisol levels, higher uh, biomarkers of stress in, a, in the wake of a gambling activity. And what we find actually is the exact opposite, which is fascinating because what it, what it, the implication of probably what, what the, the application of this is, we sit there and say, how could you take such a horrific risk like anybody else, like the bells and whistles would come on loud and clear of like, what the hell are you doing, right? And that would cause most people to put the brakes on a huge risk-taking behavior associated with the, the, the potential for financial loss or other losses. But the, what we found was the cortisol levels and all the other biomarkers of stress were subdued. In other words, through chronic gambling and the the perpetual risk-taking behaviors, all of the systems that should alert you to danger, threat, consequences, have been, they've habituated. And so, in a very matter-of-fact way, without having that uh, arousal, physiological arousal for all of the stress response systems that should say, stop, <laughs> turn back, don't go down this road, all of those things are subdued because the person's not having the regular cortical, uh, you know, biophysiological responses to what should be a, a huge stressor. And that's what perhaps allows them to make these poor decisions without really thinking about it because they're not having all of those physiological cues that would say, stop, like, no. Right? So that was a very fascinating study uh, as well. <clears throat> Um, I don't even remember what this one's about. I probably threw this in here at like midnight last night. Um, <laughs> all right, let's just move on. Uh, <coughs> sorry, I, yeah, I worked in the ER till midnight, and then I came home and I worked. I worked on this presentation, so. Um, but we did okay, right? Yeah. Um, this. Uh, Another uh, thing with the uh, Alexander Blazinski's uh, uh, study and, and on the pathways model, and then they came out with the GPQ, the gambling pathways questionnaire, that kind of measures that. They do have some uh, in this particular study. Again, what, what's the point? Well, it just shows that like you know stress proneness is correlated with problem gambling and so forth. Uh, and, and again, another study that's done that. All right, let's jump into some clinical stuff. Right? One of the things that, if any of you have ever uh, had any of my clients that have come to you because I failed to treat them effectively or because they relocated or for whatever reason, uh, you will know, they will say, yeah, Dr. Reed is all about specificity. And, and I am. And when people are, when my patients are vague, I'm like, oh, I'm all over this, right? Like, we're going to peel back the layers. And, you know, because in, it's in the details that I think we have the most uh, useful clinical information that we're going to be able to do something with. So even in the language, I want my patients to be able to use language to say, I am feeling, you know, anxious, I am feeling stressed, I am worrying, or I am fear. These are words that we often use almost, I guess, as synonyms for each other, and yet they're not, okay? And so this is a chart that I've created that actually kind of defines this, and this is based on really uh, scouring. Uh, to put this together, I, I probably went over through over 200 scientific articles on stress, looked at how they all defined it, looked at st studies on fear, worry, all the rest of that, and these are, you can have some confidence, these are pretty good scientific definitions of these constructs. And I kind of present it to patients so that they can then use language to kind of describe what really is going on for them. Okay. 
And you know, a, a one way of kind of looking at that is, is, is kind of differentiating this is in this quote. Don't ask me. I, I didn't put my name on that one. My <laughs> research assistant did that. That's weird. All right. <clears throat> so let me quote myself. Worry is having thoughts. I'm glad you guys could laugh. I'm sleep deprived. Worry is having thoughts that something bad is going to happen. Anxiety is prolonged, excessive worry that's interfering with our life and our ability to make meaningful changes. Fear arises in the moment that our worry becomes a reality in a threatening way. And stress is the belief that we're not going to be able to deal with the bad things we've been worrying about, anxious about, or afraid of. Okay? So that's actually a kind of a way to kind of differentiate these constructs that if you look at them, you know, so for example, I'm from Canada, and uh, if, I'm, if I'm driving down the road and I'm anxious because it's snowing and there's black ice, and I'm really worried and anxious, maybe both, uh, let's say I'm worried about the possibility that my car is going to spin out of control and end up in a ditch, the moment my car starts to spin is the moment I, my worry transitions to fear. Right? Because the fear is this eminent experience, like eminent danger or threat is about to happen. Um, and so I try to help you know, patients understand these constructs so when they talk about it, they can say, I am feeling stress versus I am feeling worry, but I think my worry might be escalating to the point where it's actual anxiety. Right? And helping them understand that, that spectrum of things. <coughs> Here's all the correlates that we see. Uh, with stress amongst problem gamblers. Uh, I'm going to give you just 30 seconds to save my voice and drink a, drink a little bit here. You can take a look at these correlates. So, I think all of us would probably be in agreement that, yeah, these are uh, stress correlates with, with problem gambling. And the point here is that I like to show this to clients that kind of articulate Right? Like, look at all the ways in which you may be susceptible to stress. And it's understandable that this is a stressful experience, a stressful time, and that problem gambling exacerbates that stress. Great, that's psychoeducation. But again, you know, along the lines of psychoeducation, I also talk about kind of the, um, the whole uh, HPA access and how that works, right? And I'm not going to get into this per se in a lot of detail, but what I will say, is I think in your your manual uh, there should be can I borrow this real quick? Uh, I, I let me see. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. There should be a link when it talks about that uh, that where you can click on it and it's the two minute they they have these little two minute neuroscience videos and if not if it's not in this one I'll email it again just send me an email we'll get you the copy but there's a little YouTube video that's two minutes long that explains kind of the this particular response and it's a really good thing to show to patients to kind of help them just get the gist of why physiologically and biologically it's important in, in essence they're depleting all of the uh, uh, the defense mechanisms in our body that help defend against inflammatory illness, disease, uh, and so forth. So that's why when you have chronic and prolonged stress, you deplete your cortisol and all the rest of that, and then you're not able to have a, a built-up immune system to defend. That's why you you know you have a really long stressful week, and then at the end of the week you get sick because you you know. And so just helping them understand that that and that includes like sleep deprivation, right? You know, do what I say, don't do what I do. I'm terrible at this myself in my personal life, I, I'll concede that. But at least I can, you know, I can talk about it and educate patients about it. But I don't lecture them about it or shame them about it. It's like, I'm with you, I did that. I also help patients understand kind of the model of stress. And on the one end, I say, look, you've got resources and you've got demands. And remember, Essentially, what's creating the stress is this appraisal that says there's a deficiency here. I don't have enough resources to meet the demands in my life. And as a result, stress occurs. What we don't realize is that um, you know, there's this adaptive coping if we kind of appraise this in a healthy way. If we don't, it's actually an unhealthy... Um, so, this is the point. Not being able to cope healthy in a healthy way in a stress response is actually in and of itself a demand. 
that then creates this, you know, I'm stressed out and I, I'm not good at coping with stress, and that adds to my stress, right? That's part of the demand. So really in this model, you've got three things you can manipulate with a patient. You can, with, with a gambler, you can either increase their resources, look for ways to decrease their demands, or help them reframe or reappraise in a different way. Right? And keep in mind here the whole principle of, I often talk about, and we talk about this in the mindfulness world as well, and that is, you know, pain is inevitable, suffering is optional. What do we mean by that? Well, the point here is that we're all going to be, we're all going to experience pain. But the story that we make up about our pain is going to determine whether or not we suffer. Right? So if I have a painful experience and my, my appraisal of that experience is like, I can't deal with this, I can't handle this, great, you're going to suffer. Right? Whereas if you appraise that experience in a, in a more positive way and you reframe that, uh, that you're going to reduce the amount of suffering that you experience. And that's what we mean by suffering is optional. Suffering arises out of the stories that we make up about our pain. Let me say that again. Suffering arises out of the stories that we make up about our pain. And so, if you don't want to suffer, reorganize or change the story. Right? And that's part of what we're helping them do here with the appraisals. So when I do this with patients, one of the things that I will do is I'll say, and in this workbook that you've got, is I'll say, okay, let's list your resources, let's list your demands. And the thing that you want to do with your gamblers with this is you want to move beyond the idea that the demands are all the bills that I have and the resource would be more money. Right? Um, we've got to find other ways to give them hope. And by the way, giving our patients hope is critically important because that's what we're competing with. You, you get that, right? Because the one thing that gambling can give our patients is hope. Hope of a big win, hope that I'm going to somehow, and again, it's all based on irrational thought processes. We get that. But nevertheless, that irrational uh, perspectives about the possible outcomes of gambling gives them hope. We've got to give them a, an alternative hope that's based on more rational thinking and something that's a lot more pragmatic, right? And so getting outside the normal uh, constricted versions of, of what constitutes demands and resources. So in this particular, uh, oh, I have 30 more minutes, okay, my voice is going to hold out. I, 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 I think I can, I think I can, right? That's my positive reappraisal. Um, this, this, this voice tells me, here's a good appraisal. I'm, I'm, I'm talking a lot, therefore I'm sharing a lot of good information. And that's a good thing, right? How's, how's that for appraisal, right? <laughs> uh, so, uh, resources can include something like concrete and tangible things such as having food, money, or a place to live, or intangible assets. And this is what I try to get, this is where patients struggle a little bit more, such as the ability to be assertive, knowledge, time. And I think time is one of the most invaluable resources because once it's exhausted, we can never get it back, right? Yeah. Um, and, and, and if you think about a lot of things that we do in our life, it's because we value time, we may not just realize that. So when we speed, you know, we, you know, if I say to you, do you value the law? Do you believe in being a law-abiding citizen? Oh, absolutely. Why do you speed? Well, how do you make sense of that conflict? Well. The more accurate statement is, I value my time more than I value, and, and, and the most accurate statement will be, more than I value misdemeanor uh, in, uh, uh, infractions of the law, right? Like, I'm not going to go kill somebody to, you know, or anything that would uh, cost a felony, right? And, and so we do that. Like, that's why we do U-turns where it says no, no U-turns and all the rest of that. We're taking shortcuts because we value time, right? And, and I, I'm not going to sit here and judge that. I just acknowledge that and be aware of that. Like, wow, that's interesting. I never really realized how much I value time. I'm willing to break the law so much that I value time. I'm just giving a hypothetical, Judge Moss, right? Hypothetical. <laughs> so, yeah. so, uh, all right. So, 
we've got knowledge of time access to reliable information. Like that is a resource. And oh my goodness, is that a resource? Like I'm not going to go into the whole uh, disinformation stuff that we've been in. That in itself has been stressful. Um, adequate physical health, effective communication skills. Like, again, there's so many things that we take for granted as therapists. I've had friends call me up from back in my high school days sometimes, and they'll be like, you know, hey, I'm wondering if I could bounce something off of you. I'm going through something. And I'll just say, oh, you know, I'll share something kind of matter of fact that we take for granted as therapists. And they'll be like, I just, it's like I just shared like the most jaw-dropping uh, piece of information. And so I think sometimes we need to be aware that like our, a lot of our time, our training of therapists, we take like stuff that we would consider, you know, 101 kind of things uh, are sometimes really helpful things of the other people. So helping people, you know, our patients. And effective communication skills, I'll do this also around when there's relational conflict in relation to the problem gambling, helping them communicate effectively with romantic partners. If I'm working with a romantic partner, you know, there's a whole thing there where they try to be assertive and say that they're uncomfortable and this, this and that, and then they get shut down by the problem gambler, marginalized and so forth. Or the problem gambler, because being held accountable activates their shame, then they go to their anger as a defense mechanism against the shame, right? And that's the way they try to control being held accountable. And part of that is kind of that whole, like, I'm so broken, I feel so broken already, I can't handle one more thing being wrong with me, so if you try to hold me accountable for anything, I've got to get angry to shut that down so I don't have to deal with one more thing I'm not doing right. And, and there's all of that that you're probably aware of. But um, uh, So, problem solving abilities, even have you ever thought about that? Like, hey, uh, the, the presence or absence of the ability to do good problem solving? Like that in of itself is a resource, right? Um, just to being optimistic. In fact, they've done, I love research just for these very reasons, these crazy, you know, studies that, you know, whatever. Anyway, so I'm thinking about one study where, uh, so, you know, we again run through a human, uh, a human subjects review board at the university, where in half the sample got injected with the flu virus, yeah, we paid them $800. And, um, and then the other half didn't. And we looked at variables such as optimism. And those that were optimism, optimistic, only 20% of that cohort actually developed the flu. Compared to, it was like 68% of the pessimistic sample who got injected with the flu virus actually developed the flu. And this is the controlling for a lot of other confounds. So isn't it interesting, like just something like optimism, how it can be predictive. Of course, you know, all the pessimistic ones said, I knew I was going to get the flu. <laughs> <laughs> yep, you did. So, uh, so anyway, just kind of an interesting thing, like just, again, thinking about these resources outside of the box, yeah? In, in that kind of a way. Uh, and pointing it out to them. Uh, one of the ones, do I have this one here? Um, you know, the ability to be cognitively flexible, thinking outside the box, having supportive friends, emotional health. Here's one that I often point out to my, my gamblers. You've had multiple unsuccessful attempts to try to abandon your problematic gambling. And yet here you are, again, in the therapist's office, trying. And have you ever looked at perseverance? As a, as, a, as a resource, like, wow, so many people would have given up by now, but here you are, and you're persevering. And, and to try and fail and try and fail is better than to try and fail and fail to try again. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I don't know who the citation is for that. That wasn't my quote. I wish I could say something that cool. I'm really good at quoting other people's quotes, but I, I, I don't, I'm not that creative. Uh, creativity is not one of my resources. Okay, so, uh, and then looking at demands, right? And again, kind of thinking about some of these demands. And sometimes things that are actually construed as positive traits, like, oh, you're a perfectionist, you, you, you really work hard, and we, we really have a dysfunctional relationship in positively reinforcing perfectionists in our society, right? 
oh my gosh, that was so amazing, you did such a great job, and not saying, wow, you neglected your kids, and, you know, nothing else got done this week, and yeah, you got this one thing. You know, and perfectionism, if we don't diagnose perfectionism, but it's correlated with depression and a whole constellation of other things that are really, and there's been over a thousand studies on perfectionism, right? And, and so this is an example how you know, people can seek treatment for things that aren't in the DSM, and, and we can work with that, right? Uh, <clears throat> okay. Um, so, uh, again, you can read that. All right. So, basically, I, again, helping people think outside the box and not reducing demands and resources to the presence or absence of money. And this kind of is an extension of a bigger philosophy that I often talk about, and that is, you know, gambling isn't about money any more than, you know, sex addiction is about sex or eating disorders are about food. Yes, it involves those things, but if we limit ourselves to that construct, that narrowly defined kind of thought about what the problem is, we're going to miss the whole point, right? Um, okay. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, here's just some examples, and again, I'm going to give you uh, 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 this PowerPoint, I'll give it to Carol and her staff, and they'll post it on their website, or again, you've got my email, just fire me off an email, and, and, uh, and again, uh, we'll get that out to you, but <coughs> this is some examples of some of the things that I've talked about with patients in the past, and that is, you know, how these are various examples of resources, and these are examples of demands. And one of the things that we also realize, too, is that sometimes something that is a demand can also be a resource. A good example of this would be exercise. It demands that we have to exert energy and effort and time, and so it depletes. Uh, and in that way, it's kind of a demand. But overall, it's a net resource, right? because we're going to feel better about ourselves, our bodies are going to be healthier, our uh, blood flow is going to be uh, uh, more uh, efficacious in terms of distribution of nutrients and all that to our, our cellular, uh, on the cellular level. So it, overall, it's a net resource. And sometimes we've got to get really creative with patients around some of this stuff. So I'll give you just one example. I had this one uh, gambler, and I was trying to get them, they really needed, they were depressed in addition to the gambling. Also, I wanted them to have some incompatible activities with problem gambling. And they were kind of going off on this big thing about, well, you know, blah, blah, blah. I don't have time to exercise this and that and the other. I said, what if, what if I freed up six hours of your week? Would you commit that six hours to exercise? And they kind of chuckled, sure, Dr. Reed. Sure. I said, okay, great. Let, let's, talk, and this, let's talk about how you shop. Right. And this particular patient, I think she was a female, um, and, and this was down in, in Los Angeles. And, and she talked about how like, she would go shopping at least once or twice a week to the grocery store, the drive there, and then ordering, you know, getting all the groceries, and then you know, going back home and all the rest of that. And collectively, that was taking about six hours a week for her in her time. So I knew the particular grocery store that she shopped at, and I said, okay, great. For 1% of, the, of the, the invoice price, they'll actually deliver it. So let's go on the website, let's set it up, and you can do this as a reoccurring weekly thing. And the nice thing is, once it's set up, you got your staples, and then every week you can go in, it takes 5-10 minutes, tweak what you need to order in addition to that. And, uh, and then you don't have to go out to the grocery store. And then she looks at me, and she's like, because <laughs> I, we creatively kind of bought her more time. Not only that, I mean, it's me. She's like, okay, I'll, I'll start working out. And she did. She started working out every week. She was true to her word. And she came back and she said, actually, she goes, Dr. Reese, she goes, you know what? She goes, I really like the on-site, uh, the, the ordering offline. She goes, because what I notice is I'm actually, you know, I'm always looking for good prices, and I notice like there's stuff on the website that I, when I'm in the grocery store, I don't even notice it on the shelves, and I'm actually saving more money by shopping online, and so that 1% that I have to pay the grocery store in order to, like, I'm actually, overall, I'm, I'm saving more money. And then she kind of said with a smile, so can I use that money to gamble? Hell no, hell no, that's a hard no. Uh, but, uh, so anyway. Uh, all right. Are we recording this? Because I've 
kind of have a potty mouth a little bit during this presentation. I apologize. I, I, I don't want to offend anybody. Okay. So this is kind of a, and I'm open to feedback on this. is kind of a work in process. But basically, if you think about the different types of stress, and, and again, this is important, I think, with our patients, to kind of classify stress. And, and I kind of talk about negative stress, positive stress, and then the extent to which we have control over the stress, right? And uh, so, for example, uh, up in this upper quadrant, um, you know, hey, it's a positive stress. I just learned I received an inheritance. I really didn't have any control over that. It just happened. Um, but that's a positive stress. Compared to, you know, uh, something I have control over that's also a positive stress, like I'm getting, maybe I'm getting married. Right? That could be a positive stress. A negative stress over which um, I have control is gambling losses. And I point that out. And then, for example, a, a negative stress over which I might be powerless would be like the terminal illness. So I try to give them this as an example, and then what I do is I give them a sheet, and the sheet is in, in your little uh, thing. And again, uh, you're going to probably end up all emailing, which is fine. I'm anticipating that, because it, all the links in there don't work on your hard copy, um, but it's kind of just helping you follow along if you want to make some notes. So in the, in the PDF version of this workbook, you can click on the links. It will take them to all the various resources throughout this, uh, this workbook. So, um, and then you've got the duration, which is short-term versus long-term, right? So these are the three variables in which we sit down with the gamma and say, okay, I want you to think, is it a positive or negative stressor? How are you perceiving the stress? Is it something you have control over or is it something you don't have control over? And to what degree, right? And then on top of that, I want you to think about, is this a short-term or long-term? So think about like, for example, when I have students, we just had all students wrap up a semester and we gave them final exams, right? And we stressed them all out. So one of the few times in life where you actually pay to be stressed, we call it tuition, right? And so here they are, but it's a short-term stressor, right? And it's something you have control over? Yeah, they can study more, they'll feel less stressed, right? And uh, it's positive because it's helping them achieve their outcomes of a, of a, a degree, right? So again, whatever the experiences are, helping the patients kind of classify how they perceive the stressors, and that can also be clinically relevant as well. It's like, okay, that's interesting spin on that. I might have seen that differently, and helping them do that. So that's a little uh, diagram. And again, this is kind of my own little uh, circumplex model of stress that I've kind of created based on this. If you have any feedback or thoughts or criticisms of this, I'm absolutely open to it. It's kind of in its early stages of me just thinking out loud, I guess, is what I'm doing here. Uh, we also developed the stress proneness scale, um, and we've updated this in the, F, the UCLA SDA. The UCLA SDA, it's a 22-item measure that has items for depression, items for anxiety, and then um, it also has uh, items for stress. And what's different like from measures like the PHQ-9 uh, and stuff like that is we get, again, more specificity in the, in the item responses. So I'm feeling sad, but was depressed. Okay, a few hours a week, one or two hours a few days a week, one or two hours nearly every day, about half the day near, uh, nearly every day, or most of the day nearly every day, right? So a lot more specificity in how they respond, which is clinically more useful. Um, so also the stress coping inventory that we developed, uh, we take a look at kind of how people cope with stress in terms of their strategies, right? And there are assertive strategies where people are proactive. And this is what we're doing in therapy. We're helping them be more proactive in healthy coping strategies as opposed to avoiding coping strategies. And not surprisingly, um, I, I actually, uh, last night, I ran some of our data on this. And I got a database of probably a thousand patients at this point with problem gamblers. I was just curious. And sure enough, you know, we saw on the, the, the top domains a lot more um, problem gamblers had uh, significantly higher scores on avoidance strategies compared to assertive strategies. And specifically, uh, they would go to uh, distraction, helplessness, and isolation. Those were the ones that were kind of came out as significant predictors of problem gambling. So, um, okay. So let's talk about some interventions here. And some of this stuff is in, again in your workbook. So psych education. I often help patients kind of narrow down uh, pragmatic versus, you know, hypothetical worries. Is what you're worried about something that's just hypothetical, it may or may not happen, or is it pragmatic? 
you know, hey, I'm worried, I've gambled all my money away, I've been getting phone calls from the car company, the bank, and I'm worried they're going to repossess my car. Right? So, okay, that's probably a pragmatic worry. You haven't been making payments. So, what can we, let's problem solve. All right, can we call the bank? I'm afraid to. Well, let's call. I think you're better to be proactive about this. Let's see if we can negotiate something. Well, what if I just locked the car in my garage? I can't repossess it. No, 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 no. That's an avoided strategy. That's not good. Let's tackle this head on. So, helping them develop uh, problem solving solutions for practical worries, and then helping them learn how to let go of some of the hypothetical worries. Um, helping them understand that, like, it's their perception. Can we, is there a different way we can look at this? Right? Um, looking at common interventions for financial challenges, you know, uh, uh, setting up a budget, the GA pressure relief meetings, and things like that. Um, I, helping them identify sources of stress. Again, um, sometimes stress is related to unrealistic goals, or, um, you know, helping them recalibrate their expectations towards their goal attainment. You know, those can be sorts of things. And sometimes, sometimes it really means a lot. Again, they look at us as authority figures in their life, uh, although I try to develop more of a collaborative relationship. But they still, you know, when you got a doctor behind your name, at least for me, my experience, you know, they still expect you to spoon feed them. It's like, no, no, let's work together on this. But sometimes it means a lot to hear them say, wow, like, you are trying to manage all of those things in your life? Like, and they, they step back and say, oh, yeah, I guess it is a lot. Like, yeah, it is. Like, that's not sustainable, right? And if anybody wants to do a therapy session with me about that in my own life afterwards, we can talk about that. But um, Ken McGonigal, I always have my patients watch this YouTube video, uh, uh, Learning to Make Stress Your Friend. And she helps people do a really good job of reframing stress uh, in that regard. And I think uh, she's done some brilliant work. Her class at Stanford um, has really taken off. Her and I were at a conference in San Diego a few years ago, both speaking, and, and I talked to her a little bit. And uh, she's like, wow, she goes, yeah, she goes, this is like one of the most popular undergraduate classes right now. In fact, it was so popular, they opened up to the community. Uh, her class on stress uh, uh, has just taken off, and, and she's making a crap load of money on this book. But anyway, um, I said, I, I mentioned your book. You should buy me lunch today. Uh, so uh, time management, uh, and again, you've got to have specificity around the time management. So we know, for example, 25% of our problem gamblers have adult ADHD, and time management deficits are common in patients with ADHD. Or is it time management, for example, some people are people pleasers. And people pleasers tend to overcommit, and therefore they, they don't think about, you know, they're quick to say yes, they don't really think about the implications of that yes and, and the commitment of time, they also. So get down to the, the nuts and bolts of what the time management deficits are and then help them that. With my ADHD patients, I'll often say, look, you know, we know that patients with ADHD, we all over, over underestimate time. The average person, we underestimate time about 8 to, to 11 percent. So guess what? When the push comes to shove, we can make up that in a crunch. The patient with ADHD underestimates time 28 to 33 percent. Wow. So they're not going to be able to make up those deficits and then that creates great stress for them. So I tell them you've got to knock off 30, a third a third of, I got on my glasses, what what I got, 10 minutes? 10 minutes. Oh, okay, that was a pretty good guess, huh? Um, okay, so, uh, you know, helping them uh, develop uh, those types of strategies. Uh, I, I love this particular talk, uh, everything you think you know about addiction is wrong, um, and again, this individual talks about the idea of connecting and that uh, perceived emotional support and all the rest of that. Uh, so, uh, you know, making amends with families and attending GA and that connection, and we find that people that are more connected and have those associations are less likely to have addictive behaviors. I'll often help my patients do the wheel of life balance, right? And there's a link on this web, this PowerPoint, which I don't think we have internet access, but um, uh, if you click on this, there's actually an automated one that can go through. And, and again, if you don't know about the Wheel of Life Balance, uh, you can Google it, look it up on YouTube. But it kind of helps people see where their life is out of balance. And again, addiction is all about imbalance, right? They've lost perspective. So part of our goal in therapy is to help them regain that perspective, right? And figure out where the balance deficits are. And the Wheel of Life Balance is a really great way of, of doing that. So again, then you can kind of take a look at, based on a 10 scale for each one, maybe where the deficits are. 
Uh, again, relaxation techniques. Uh, there's a, some websites there that have some different things. So biofeedback. I also use the stress eraser. I have it in my office. Uh, I'm a cheapskate. I got like a refurbished version for 99 bucks. Um, but I actually, I, it, it, and what, basically through the, the, the graphical feedback, they can see what, like we all say, well, when you're stressed out, breathe. Well, that's useless. Again, specificity, specificity, specificity. Let me show you when we say breathe when you're feeling stressed out, let's go into detail about what that looks like, what that feels like. Put your finger in this uh, little response that does based on your their pulse of their index finger, and they can I take 10 minutes and teach them experientially based on the feedback that they're getting here. When we say breathe, what breathing looks like. And by the way, if those of you know that if I, like I cannot have a proper if I'm respirating at 12 to 14 breaths a minute, it is impossible to have simultaneously a panic attack because it subdues the parasympathetic nervous system right with that respiration rate. You cannot simultaneously have a panic attack. So helping them actually experientially in your office learn when we say breathe. We're not just take a couple deep breaths. No, start going into your breathing mode for about three to five minutes. And this is how it feels. Look, okay, now you're getting it, right? So I use a stress eraser. Uh, the old eat, move, sleep, you all know that. I love this particular app, and again, it's in the handout. You know, and what I love about this is it focuses not on exercise, but you can track physical activity. So if you're out there in your garden gardening, you get credit for that. Right? If you're doing household chores and, and so forth, you get credit for that as physical activity. And, and that's the thing, we focus too much on exercise and we marginalize other things that constitute physical activity. Mindfulness, again, on the YouTube website uh, for UCLA, I did a whole hour presentation on this. Um, and so lots of resources there. Um, the study that we did on mindfulness, blah, 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 you all know that, it's good. <laughs> Gratitude practices. I actually did a little literature on gratitude of over 210 studies. And this video on YouTube that's on the, the, the UCLA channel, I talk about gratitude practices. Problem gamblers are so focused on the negatives, helping them cultivate a gratitude practice. Again, it's that reframing, reorganizing their appraisals of their life experiences and everything that's going on. And that gratitude practice, but again, in the video, I talk about examples. I kind of looked at the three of the top gratitude researchers. I mean, these are professors that devote their entire careers to gratitude, right? Like, let's see what they're finding. And I kind of cite some of their research in that video. And that video is on the electronic copy of the workbook that I'm going to email you because you're going to email us. All right. Um, and then here are, if you were to say, you know, you, you ordered all these books, which ones kind of stood out for you? These are some of the books that, that I thought had some good content in them. They're books that if a patient, you know, and what I do with the books with patients, I'll say, hey, go check out Amazon, look at the reviews, see what resonates with you, and then, you know, if it's got good reviews, go ahead and, and, and tackle that. But I'm not afraid to give them my own recommended reading list and say, but again, be aware you've got some patients that have ADHD, um, have them get the audio books, and even then, you know, sometimes it's great to give them the cliff notes of, of what you learned out of that book. And my policy is I never, ever, 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 ever recommend a book to a patient I have not put eyes on and opened the, the, the cover and spent some time in. I just think that's disingenuous to our patients to do that. Uh, all right, so the summary is whatever it says. <laughs> I'm so tired, you guys. I'm sorry. This was not right. I should have gotten better sleep last night, but. Um, uh, okay, so, oh, and then there's the, there's the workbook, and there's my email, so, all right, okay, I've got five minutes for questions,